Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, we're going to do another story tonight. Uh, I thought maybe we'd do a series from this book. It's uh, Murder in the Heartland by Harry Spiller. We're going to do an audio version. I'm going to read another story that happened in Marion, Illinois on July 14th, 1984. And like I said, if you guys have any questions, um, just shoot me it in the comments and I'll respond. Um, if you like this type of series, let me know. If there are any books that you want for me to read, let me know. So we're going to get go ahead and get started because this is, has a few pages to it. So, And I'm going to try and keep the, the videos not so long. So here we go. It's called The Axe Murder, and like I said, July 14th, 1984, Marion, Illinois. A call that a house was burning came into Illinois Marion Fire Department at 6.06 .06 p.m. on July 14th, 1984. Firefighters scurried to the vehicles and were soon speeding across the city to a smoke-filled home on Monroe Street. It was a humid summer evening, and as they set to work extinguishing the blaze, as they did so, the firefighting team led by Fire Chief Charles Hyde discovered a black woman lying in the southwest bedroom of the dwelling. They noticed some wounds in the back of her head and found a bloodstained axe lying near her. Believing the woman to still be alive, the firefighters had her transported to a local hospital for emergency treatment. Meanwhile, Chief Hyde radioed the police department to report the suspicious circumstances surrounding the discovery. Detective Paul Michael Wiseman arrived on the scene at 635 and got a rundown on the facts from Chief Hyde. The chief told Wiseman that the woman had been rushed to the hospital in the belief that she was alive, but word had been received that she had been pronounced dead on arrival. Chief Hyde told the detective that the victim was found on her stomach across the bed. He described the wounds on the back of the head, he said that the axe had been double-bladed and covered with blood. Shortly, Detective Mike Snyder joined Wiseman at the scene, and the two police probers roped off the entire area around the house with crime scene tape. Then Snyder requested assistance from the State of Illinois Crime Lab and the Division of Criminal Investigation, DCI, of the Illinois Department of Law Enforcement. He also asked the State Fire Marshal's Office to send an arson investigator. Crime scene tech Frank Cooper of the State Crime Lab soon arrived at the scene. He inspected the bedroom and the house, which was situated on the east side of South Monroe Street facing west. He then took photographs of the single-story wood frame residence, which consisted of a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, two bedrooms, a bathroom, and an enclosed back porch and an enclosed front porch. Cooper finished photographing the exterior and then moved inside. The heaviest amount of fire damage was in the dining room area, but the rest of the dwelling has sustained heavy damage. After the technician was done photographing the crime scene, he began to collect, package, and mark the physical evidence, which he included the bedspread from the bed, a curtain from the south window and the southwest bedroom, the double-bladed axe, a hatchet from the couch in the living room, four prescription bottles from the living room floor, a pullover shirt brand name Pro Shop from the bed in the southeast bedroom and a pink fitted sheet from the same bed. Tech Cooper left the scene and drove to the morgue at the local hospital and took inked fingerprints and palm prints of Madeline Willis, the dead woman. In a coordinated effort with Tech Cooper, State Fire Marshal Barney West investigated the crime scene. He eliminated all accidental causes then he determined that they were three separate unrelated fires, one in the southeast bedroom, one in the dining room, and one in the living room. Each fire had been set with trash and paper. Thus, the arson investigator ruled that the fire was ar arson. Detectives began to canvass witnesses by interviewing the firefighters at the scene. Fireman Carl Kelton, a nine-year veteran, said that he'd received a call from an unidentified woman who reported the house on Monroe Street burning. He and the assistant fire chief, Paul Barnwell, responded. 
arriving approximately one and a half minutes later. Kelton approached the residence and saw smoke coming from the dining room window on the north side of the residence. It appeared to him that all the other windows were closed. The fireman connected and charged a water hose. Barnwell began spraying the fire through the open window while Kelton removed an exhaust fan from the fire truck to place in the front door. While he was getting the fan, Keaton saw the front storm door of the residence closing. As he approached the residence with the exhaust fan, a person wearing hair rollers, who Keaton thought was a woman, came out of the front storm door, went down the steps, and proceeded to the south. Keaton continued toward the door, but he was unable to install the fan in the doorway. Keaton then entered the burning structure through the front door and went into the living room. He looked toward the southwest bedroom and could see the outline of the bedroom window, as well as the outline of the bed. It appeared to the fireman that some clothes or pillows were lying on the bed. Then he tried to enter the dining room but was prevented by excessive smoke and heat. Keaton could hear some popping and cracking sounds, so he went outside and took the hose from Barnwell. Barnwell went to the rear of the house to open the door, while Keaton attempted to force the smoke and heat out of the rear of the house with the water hose. His efforts were in vain. Keaton came back out of the front of the residence and encountered two black men standing at the bottom of the front steps. They asked the firefighter, did she get out? Keaton told the men that she had come out of the house when the firemen had first arrived. He pointed to the woman with rollers in her hair standing about 50 feet away and said, there she is. They screamed, that's not her. The firemen quickly turned and re-entered the house. He yelled out, is anybody here? He got no response. When he went back out the front door, a man standing at the bottom of the steps told Keaton that his mother was in the house and that he was in that she was in the first bedroom on the right. Keaton went back inside but could not reach the bedroom because of the heat and smoke. Two emergency medical technicians wearing air packs entered with Keaton and made their way to the southwest bedroom. Keaton could not see a woman or could see a woman's legs and told one tech to call for an ambulance. Assisted by the other tech, Keaton carried the unconscious woman outside. He saw blood on her face. When the ambulance arrived, several firefighters assisted ambulance personnel with placing the victim on the cot. Keaton said that as they lifted the victim, her head fell back, and when he placed his hand under her head, he could feel a large opening or crease in her skull. He removed his hands after placing her on the cot, and both of them were bloody. After assisting the victim, the fireman was advised that her nephew might be in the back bedroom. Keaton entered the house once again wearing an air pack and made a search. He found no one else inside. Keaton returned to the woman's bedroom and saw blood and hair at the foot of the bed. A bunch of clothes on the floor was piled almost as high as the bed. Leaning against the dresser was a double-bladed axe. Its blade was covered with blood and hair. The fireman said that he continued moving through the house by dropping to his knees in order to breathe better. While he was crawling through the living room, he also saw a hatchet on the couch. This hatchet did not appear to have any stains on the blade or handle. Local bystanders informed police that one Leo Willis was the victim's nephew. He had been seen walking west on New Route 13 at 6.15 p.m. Police began a search for him. When detectives returned to the police station, they received a call from a Marion resident saying that Willis had returned the fire damage, returned to the fire damaged house. Detectives went to the residence and found him hiding in the attic. A friend of his talked him into coming down. He was then transported to the Marion PD for questioning. At 11.23 p.m. on July 14th, Detective Weissman and DCI Special, Special Agent Greg Geitman interviewed Leo L. Willis. Willis said that he, Madeline, and another relative had eaten together just before noon. Then he'd gone to a local store, picked up some orange juice, and returned home. He said that Madeline and the other relatives started to ask him a lot of questions. Why didn't he eat more? What was he thinking about? Then they began to talk about him, so he went to bed. He was startled awake by a smoke alarm going off. He got up, changed his pajamas for some street clothes, got some cigarettes, and left the house through the front door. 
Then he ran across town to a friend's home. Detectives asked him where Madeline Willis had been when he left the house. He responded, I don't know. The lawman had observed bloodstains on Willis' pants. They asked him where the blood had come from. Oh, do I have blood on my pants? He responded. Realizing that they were going to get nowhere with the questioning, detectives placed Leo Willis under arrest and transported him to Williamson County Jail. While he was being booked, they took his clothes into evidence. At 8 a.m. the following day, Tech Cooper met with detectives at the victim's home and resumed the crime scene processing. Additional photographs were taken of the interior. A white towel and a pink plastic waste basket were collected from the southwest bedroom, marked and placed into evidence. At 10.30 a.m., Cooper headed for the hospital to attend the autopsy of Madeline Willis. The postmortem examination was performed by Dr. A.S. Thompson shortly after. The pathologist determined that death had been caused by the savage cutting wounds to the back of the victim's head and her neck, her spinal cord, had been massive bleeding. The case investigators continued their neighborhood canvas. One relative told them that he'd had breakfast at the Willis home about 9 a.m. He said that he and Madeline had spent the morning in the backyard. About two o'clock in the afternoon, he'd gone or she'd gone back into the house to prepare the next meal. At that time, Leo was just getting out of bed. When the meal was finished, said the relative, Madeline asked Leo if he wanted something to eat. He didn't answer. According to the relative, Leo had not eaten with his family for more than a month. He would go to the store, buy food, and return to his bedroom and eat his meal by himself. The relative told the police that he himself ate dinner and then went back to his own home, where he took some required medicine and laid down to rest. He was awakened later by someone knocking on his back door. When he went outside, he heard sirens and thought that if someone had set fire to a house just north of Madeline's. Then when he realized that it was Madeline's house burning, he ran to the back door, but it was unable to get inside. He turned and ran through the garage to the front door. There was too much smoke for him to enter, so the relative got down on his hands and knees to see if he could spot Madeline. Unable to see her, he went around to Leo's bedroom and banged on the window. There was no response. Now the kinsman ran to Madeline's bedroom window. He got an old tire to stand on so he could see in. He pulled the screen off and could see Madeline lying on the bed with her head near the window. She was face down with her right arm slightly extended above her head. The relative said that he then told firemen that she was still inside the residence. He also said that the last time he'd seen Leo was when he had left Madeline's residence. Madeline had told him that she had gone to sleep in her chair in the living room on occasions, but when she woke up, Leo would be standing over her. The relative said that Madeline would sleep with her clothes off only when she was by herself. Moreover, he'd heard that Madeline was carrying a pistol for protection against Leo. The relative said that Leo thought Madeline should take better care of him, and as a result, he did not like her anymore. The kinsman also said, also told police that Leo had a history of mental problems. Next, the police questioned a neighbor. He said that he'd seen Leo only once during the day at about 1.30. Leo was in the garage of the Willis residence. He then went to a small building near the garage and returned to the residence. At about 8 p.m., the neighbor was sitting in his carport when he noticed smoke coming from the residence. He ran there and tried to get in through both the front and back doors, but the smoke stopped him. Then he went to Madeline's bedroom, where he found Madeline's relative standing on a tire and trying to see. The relative pulled the screen off in the window and then fell back, yelling, Oh my God. A friend interviewed by detectives said that they'd received a call that the house was on fire and that Madeline was injured. He went to the scene where an acquaintance told him that Madeline was dead and Leo could not be found. He decided to drive around himself to see if he could spot the man. When another friend found Leo, before the police arrived, Leo told him the house had apparently caught fire and that he came to a friend's residence because he had no place to go. Told that Madeline was hurt, Leo said he hadn't seen her before he'd left. As they walked toward the patio of the residence while waiting for the police, the friend said that Leo was shaking all over. 
He told Leo that an axe had been found in the house near Madeline, and he asked Leo if he'd hit her with it. Leo replied that he woke up and the house was on fire, so he just ran out of the house. He added that Madeline was mad at him. The acquaintance then told Leo that his Aunt Madeline did not show any emotion or surprise. Leo just sat and shook all over. The friend told Probrus he did not believe that Leo understood that Madeline was dead. Continuing, the witness said that ever since Leo had gone into the U.S. Navy, his personality had changed completely. He was very quiet and removed from the rest of his surroundings, and frequently would not converse with anyone. He said that during the fall of 83, Leo Willis had been arrested and sent to Alton Mental Health Center. A psychological evaluation had been done on him, and Leo remained there for December 83 to March to 84. Another neighbor told police that it did not surprise her that Leo had killed Madeline because there had been bad blood between the two since 79. The witness said that Leo and his aunt had a good relationship until other relatives had moved into the area. Leo, Madeline, and the other relatives began having financial troubles, and Leo thought that his aunt was always siding with the others. He even accused his aunt of stealing money from him to give to them. In the summer of 82, the woman friend was visiting with Leo, who was in the Navy at the time. On one occasion, Leo told her, told her to watch how people were talking about him and making fun of him. The friend indicated to Leo that there wasn't anyone making fun of him, but it didn't seem to matter. A short time later, Leo went AWOL. After Leo came home, he had changed considerably. According to the woman, he was no longer a nice, polite person, but a very angry man. He told her that he could hear voices telling him what to do. She said that Madeline was afraid of Leo. She kept a gun for protection from her nephew and was afraid to go to bed because she didn't know what Leo might do to her. As a result, Madeline often slept in a chair in the living room. The detective's next move was to question a former schoolmate of the nephew. The man said that Leo was into body language, meaning that if you moved your hand a certain way, it meant some type of harm would come to you. According to the schoolmate, Leo had been raised very close to white people and did not seem to accept black culture very well. The man had not seen Leo since Leo had been sent to the mental health center in 83. Deputy Sheriff Bill Johnson of the Williamson County Sheriff's Department was questioned next. He had known Leo in high school. The deputy knew of no problems that Leo might have had while in school. Leo seemed to be level-headed and didn't pick fights or cause trouble. While working on communications one evening in October or November 1983, the deputy recalled an incident involving Leo. According to Johnson, Leo came to the sheriff's office at approximately 1 a.m. He told Johnson that someone in the Navy wanted to kill him, that someone was also going to kill Madeline Willis. The deputy called Madeline, and she told him that she was scared of Leo. Meanwhile, Leo did not believe that the deputy was talking with his aunt. It was Johnson's opinion that Leo was or had been using drugs. Johnson said he thought Leo needed mental help, and in fact, he said Leo had requested help. The deputy contacted a mental health counselor. She talked with <coughs> Leo over the phone and concluded that he was using drugs. Johnson said that Leo was bound and determined to go home. While the deputy was uh, getting a blanket for Leo, who was dressed in gym shorts, Leo told him twice that he heard vo voices. The deputy gave him the blanket, and that was the last time he saw Leo. The investigation continued with the questioning of an old friend of the victim's. According to her, she had last talked with Madeline on Friday, July 13th. At that time, the friend indicated she had taken the victim to a local grocery store and Leo had been with them. As they were returning home from the store, they stopped at a yard sale. Leo got out of the car and started walking down the street. His aunt told him that they would just take him home, but he walked on without responding. As they were returning home, Madeline told her friend that Leo wanted to go to Michigan to see his relatives, but she wanted him to take treatment first. Madeline further explained that her nephew had quit eating for approximately three weeks and would not talk. The friend told police that Madeline had taken Leo to Jefferson's barracks about two weeks ago and that he spoke only one time. 
Leo did all right for a while, but then he started with walking late at night. On one particular occasion, Madeline told her, she woke up and Leo was standing over her. She told him to go to get out of her face. The victim said that her nephew would often just stare. One witness told police that she and the victim were talking about guns one day and that Madeline did, did own a small handgun, but the friend had noticed the gun in Madeline's pocket of her smock top on several occasions. She did most of her sleeping in a chair in the living room. She would fall asleep while watching television and wake up early in the morning. The friend told officers the reason the victim had all her clothes in the bedroom was that she could separate the summer clothes from the winter clothes. <clears throat> Another friend of the victim said that he had probably spoken to Madeline about three weeks ago when she called him and asked him if he could furnish transportation to the Jefferson Barracks. The victim told him that she was trying to get a doctor to look at her nephew because she was alarmed at the way he had been acting in the last few months. He told the detectives that Madeline normally kept her personal family problems to herself. He could never remember a time when she was relate, had related any of her personal problems to him. Probers interviewed a neighbor who had spoken with Leo just a few days before the murder. According to her, Leo did not appear to care about anything. He told her that during the conversation with the, his father was the twelfth devil. He, she said that he, she was not surprised at all to hear that Madeline had been murdered and that Leo was the alleged perpetrator. Police ended their canvas by interview, interviewing a local bartender. He said that about three months ago, Leo was in a bar drinking. For no apparent reason, he grabbed a customer around the throat and began choking him. Realizing that he was not joking around and about to do great bodily harm to the customer, the bartender pulled a handgun, pointed at Willis, and ordered him to turn the man loose. Just before the incident took place, Said the barkeep, Willis was playing the jukebox and dancing alone, as well as talking to himself, while he was listening to the music and dancing. The bartender had not seen Leo since then. Meanwhile, Tech Cooper received the test results of the evidence taken from the crime scene. The bedspread, Madeline's pink top, the curtain, the double-bladed axe, Leo's pullover, the pink fitted sheet, and Leo's pants were all found to have human blood on them. The blood analysis indicated that Madeline Willis had type O blood and Willis and Leo had type A. As a result, the blood on the bedspread and the sheer curtain in Madeline's bedroom and the pink fitted sheet from Leo's bedroom, as well as his pants, indicated that the blood could have come from Madeline, but not from Leo. Leo was given a psych exam on September 3rd, 1984. The study was of material elicited from Leo's indicated that although he was able to relate for brief periods of time in a rational, coherent manner to a questioner or problem presented to him, he quickly became tangential and irrelevant. His association processes were loosely organized and in fact at times disorganized. They say he appeared, according to the doctor, to be living autistically. The conclusion was that Leo Willis had a major mental illness present and active. The diagnosis was schizophrenia, undifferentiated, and chronic. The doctor said that Willis knew there were charges against him and was able to list them fairly accurate. In addition, Leo believed the charges were serious and followed the word serious with the words prison chair. On the other hand, According to the doctor, Willis could not appropriately cooperate in his defense. This was based upon the fact that Willis was found to be largely autistic and there was even an unpredictability about how he would be able to handle himself in a court situation. Therefore, the doctor found Leo unfit to stand trial. The First Circuit Court in Williamson County, Illinois, found Leo Willis unfit to stand trial and he was transported to the state mental institution. After several months of treatment, however, the court reversed its decision. And in 85, the First Circuit Court in Williamson County found Leo Willis guilty but mentally ill of the murder. The defendant received 65 years for the murder and 7 years for arson. He is now serving that time in Menard Prison in Chester, Illinois.
Wow. Now that's really sad, and that's, um, I, I want to do a little bit of quick commentary, because I'm going to try and keep it under 30 minutes, but it's really sad that he was, um, they found him schizophrenic and autistic, maybe, and everything, and she was trying to get him help, and, and it makes me wonder, did he have these issues before he even went into the military, or did the fact of how harsh the military can be brought that side out? I don't know. I don't know. Um, as a person myself that deals with bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder, I can see how um, I'm not military. There was to be no way I could go in the military. Um, I'm too sensitive. Uh, I, I couldn't handle um, my officer in my face screaming, you, you can do it, maggot, or whatever. You know, you see them stories, you hear stories. You, I, I really don't know if that's how it is, but that's how I perceive it. So, I would not be good in that type of setting. Now... The fact that he was unfit to stand trial and he is in Menard Correctional, that kind of bothers me. Um, but I wasn't there at the case, so I guess it would really, it, it, it would just be really hard to make that decision. I, I wouldn't want that job in, for no amount of money on where this man would spend his, his life. I mean, because he did something so horrific, and he still had the afterthought to um, hide his crime. Makes me think that, you know, he still had somewhat together. His, his thinking was still somewhat straight, and maybe even a tad premeditated. I don't know. But... If you like the story or if you have any questions or, or any comments to what I've said, um, let me know. How do you feel about that the, with the mentally unfit? Should they spend life in prison for their crimes or do time in, in a mental health facility? Let's open up that, that um, dialogue. But you guys have a great night and thank you for listening.